Insomniac Spider-Man turns five this year. That's right, it's been half a decade since we first put on the white spider suit, saved the city, and chased that pigeon. It is my responsibility to catch that pigeon. And so in this video, I wanted to revisit 2018 Spider-Man to see how well it's aged in the past five years and if it still holds up to modern AAA games. Now, two quick things to note, I will be going into full story spoilers, and I'm playing the PlayStation 5 remaster. Okay, let's begin. To me, the opening level of this game was and still is one of the best in modern games. It does a great job at immersing the player into Spider-Man's world. The game starts with a sweeping shot of Peter's room. This acts as a great visual recap and a reminder of the Spider-Man lore and backstory, while also setting up future plot points, foreshadowing elements, and throwing in a few easter eggs for good measure. This first opening scene also holds true to the spirit of the character, a young man struggling to balance both the superheroic and not so superheroic heroic part of his life. And then we get the seamless transition from cutscene to swinging which feels great hearkening back to the swinging from Spider-Man 2. And five years later Manhattan still looks incredible thanks to the remaster on the PlayStation 5. But even if you're playing the original PlayStation 4 version of this game, the visuals still hold up really well. Of course, what would a Spider-Man game be without combat, which is inspired by the Arkham game's free-flow counter-combat? And Insomniac struck a really nice balance between holding your hand and letting you feel like you're doing enough to make it satisfying. And from the get-go, the combat is infused with an assortment of Spidey powers. We've got web strikes, web shooters, and acrobatic finishes, all of which go a long way in making you feel like Spider-Man. This intro mission also feels like it's been pulled straight from the pages of a comic book. Peter helps the police take down the Kingpin, taking on his private army, saving hostages, all the while getting calls from the unsuspecting Aunt May. Peter then has a boss fight against the Kingpin, followed by some good old-fashioned quick time events. Thankfully this time they're a bit more impressive than they were in Spider-Man 3. With this opening set piece done, the next few chapters focus on introducing the player to the wider game. And you can see straight away Insomniac Spider-Man doesn't try to reinvent gaming. Instead, it builds on tried and true features and tropes like the skill tree, crafting, customization, unlockable costumes, map towers, and a ton of collectibles. Now, this was far from the first open world sandbox Spider-Man adventure, and many of its predecessors did struggle at packing Manhattan with enough content to make it feel like a place worth exploring exploring, and not just a collection of buildings you've wow. got to traverse to get to the next mission. Well, this version of New York is absolutely filled with content. From side quests to landmark photography to Fisk hideouts, demon warehouses, research stations, black cat stakeouts, and just good old fashioned street thugs committing crimes every few blocks. Sometimes you've just got to beat them up, and sometimes they're in a getaway car, and this part seems to be an homage to the car section in Spider-Man 2. The developers also did a great great job capturing the essence of New York, from the glamorous parts to the not so glamorous. And it looks like all the Crown Vicks from Spider-Man 3 have now been replaced with whatever the hell this is. There's no dynamic day-night cycle, instead the time of day changes depending on the story. And speaking of appearance, I'm not quite sure why they decided to change Peter's face. When it comes to the main campaign, a big chunk of the missions will have Peter swinging, crawling, and punching his way out of situations. And these are the ones that stick in your head when you remember this game, but replaying it, I was surprised just how many of the missions weren't Spider-Man based. In fact, the very second mission in this game has Peter in a lab coat doing some basic puzzles. And it's almost like the developers are telling you, look, don't expect every mission to be this grand set piece. But even these slower paced missions are often packed with a bunch of background elements that give added depth to the story and characters if you choose to explore them. Ah, oh, Mr. Lee, what a kind billionaire philanthropist. If anyone was ever not a supervillain, it would be this guy. Insomniac Spider-Man also borrows the Arkham game's stealth gameplay and purge takedown mechanics. It's funny how none of these generic goons ever look up. And speaking of stealth, let's talk about the MJ sections. These were seen as the most boring parts of the game when it first came out, and I'm afraid they haven't exactly aged well. Look, I appreciate that having another character's point of view gives a broader perspective to the plot, but the gameplay itself, especially early on, makes the clue finding segments in L.A. Noir feel exhilarating. And I think it's the contrast that makes it feel so jarring. If this was like a JRPG which was already filled with walking and talking, then sections like 
like this would probably fit better. But a lot of these missions are spliced between web swinging, helicopter fighting, gravity defining Spider-Man missions. Now when it comes to the plot, not making this an origin story was a really smart move. Peter has already been Spider-Man for 8 years. This means there's already a fair amount of backstory, he's got his own rogues gallery of villains, and a bunch of personal baggage. The story starts with Peter and MJ actually broken up. Norman Osborn isn't just CEO of Oscorp, he's also mayor. However, this being an original Spider-Man story, it allowed for the developers to rejig several of the established canon elements. For example, at the start of this game, Miles Morales is just a regular kid, and Otto Octavius is still just a scientist. In this timeline, him and Norman actually founded Oscorp back in the day. Osborn's hubris and Octavius's resentment actually end up driving the main plot. And speaking of character, I really like that the game remembers to focus on Peter's personal struggles every now and then. Which between all the high stakes action, we get missions like this where Peter gets evicted from his apartment and has to look all around the city for a garbage truck with his stuff. But of course the bread and butter of this game are still the big set pieces. Like the Fisk Tower attack, which ends with a wrecking ball helicopter chase through the city and an over the top takedown sequence. With the player fully immersed in the game's plot and sandbox, Act 1 of the game ends with a major story pivot. The demon gang attack Osborne during a rally. Although for a moment it does look like one of those medication ads. When headache strikes. When heartburn strikes. Anyway, we're introduced to Miles Morales whose father tragically dies at the hands of the demons who are run by Mr. Lee. Oh no, not you Mr. Lee. The game's second act has Peter and his allies try to stop the mysterious demon gang and find Martin Lee. Or as he's better known, Mr. Negative. We get more combat based Spidey missions and more MJ missions. But it's not all just fighting and sneaking missions like the Halloween College Party is another standout. I like all the different Spider-Men in this one. The dancing Spidey, the depressed Spidey, and the dad bod Spidey. Peter then sneaks into the Oscorp building and finds out that Norman has accidentally created a bioweapon called the Devil's Breath. And this is what Lee and the demons have been trying to steal. That's terrible, but it's nice of Norman to put all of this into a stylish PowerPoint presentation. As the story goes on, the city slowly gets enthralled in chaos. Osborne hires Sable International to protect him, and they end up putting a bunch of checkpoints throughout the city and getting into random battles with the demons. Look, I'm just minding my own business, perching, and then bam, just a gunfight breaks out around me. Look, I'd like to help you guys, but I've got to catch this pigeon. Finally, Peter fights and apprehends Mr. Negative, but it's not all sunshine and roses. Because now MJ is mad, probably because she didn't get enough playtime. And again, it's the little details that really elevate this game, like Peter panic texting MJ while casually web swinging around town. Also, you know he's panicking because he's using full punctuation. Meanwhile, Octavius finally gets the arms. Oh no, we all know where this is going. That's right, to another puzzle. But seriously, I think the developers did a great job with Octavius's turn to the dark, side and motivations. Not only is he suffering from a degenerative disease, but he spent his entire life in the shadow of Norman Osborn, the man that took everything away from him. Plus, just look at that bastard's hairline. Who wouldn't be jealous? The second act ends with another incredible set piece. This time it's a big breakout on the prison island. And if that's not bad enough, all of his super foes have now been freed. And in another plot twist, it turns out that Otto is the one responsible for it. He defeats Spider-Man and assembles the sinister to six, featuring Martin Lee. Octavius then unleashes the dragon's breath all over New York in an attempt to get revenge on Osborne. And by the time we get to the third act, the city is now completely enthralled in chaos. Most of the third act is based around Peter figuring out Doc Ock's evil plan and then taking the city back from the bad guys. Each of the classic villains get their own level and boss fight, the most memorable being Scorpion's poison mission which causes Peter to hallucinate. Not only does he have to swing through the city, City as it slowly fills with poison while avoiding giant scorpion tails, but the developers also use this as an opportunity to delve inside Peter's mind and show his fears and insecurities. Of course, Miles and MJ get one more sneaking mission each. Poor Miles finds himself at some construction site barely surviving an encounter with the rhino. Meanwhile, MJ gets to sneak into Norman Osborn's penthouse. Ugh, Norman would have a pool. Which looks like it was built by a 10 year old in Sims using the infinite money cheat. We've got a expensive furniture everywhere, two swimming pools, and a giant bathroom with no actual toilet. It's funny how the developers put all this detail in, but then just used one of the light poles from the street. Look, it's still
still got stickers and grime all over it. And so Peter defeats all the villains, but Octavius gets away, holding both the antidote for Devil's Breath and Norman Osborn hostage. Peter builds himself a new suit and goes after Doc Ock for one final climactic battle. I like that this game's entire plot is basically a bioweapon has been unleashed on New York because of a dick measuring contest between two boomers. As expected, the final battle is a great set piece, but it chooses to focus less on the action and more on the characters and the emotional conflict, which is what Spider-Man has always been all about. Peter defeats Doc Ock, but ends up losing a mentor and a friend. And to make things worse, he then has to make the trademark impossible choice. Use the only vial of antidote to save his aunt, or synthesize it and save the entire city. The game ends with an epilogue set a few months later where Peter and MJ end up getting back together and Miles reveals his new powers, setting up the spin-off. And of course there are three DLCs, which I won't be covering in this video, but they're also very good. And so there we have it, Insomniac Spider-Man. So, how well has it aged in the past five years? Well, let's start with the story. I was really impressed with how well the game balances so many plot threads. The friends turned enemy story between Peter and Otto, the other bad guys like Fisk, Lee, and the classic villains. Norman Osborn's story is flashed out, as are Peter's interpersonal stories with MJ, May, and Miles. Although that last one does feel a little shoehorned in for the future spin-off, but you can kind of let it slide because it also turns out to be a really good game. Saying that, none of the characters in this game feel like they're making an extended cameo or ticking some kind of a box. Each one has their own motivations, fears, struggles, and unique relationships with Peter. The story does ride by the character of Spider-Man, balancing both the superhero with the personal struggles of Peter Parker. In the past five years, we've had several very good big budget Spider-Man stories, and I think this one is still on par with the best of them. Now, gameplay-wise, I think Insomniac did a great job in crafting a comprehensive modern open world game. Yes, it does lean on many of the contemporary sandbox tropes, but it executes the vast majority of them really well. Manhattan is a joy to web swing around and it's filled to the brim with side quests and easter eggs. The combat is sleek and satisfying, throwing in new moves and tricks to avoid getting stale in the later sections of the game. Yes, the MJ and Miles missions along with the occasional puzzle sections do feel like a bit of a lull in the gameplay, but the dozen or so major set pieces scattered throughout the campaign are so good that they more than make up for it. The rich gameplay and sandbox mixed with the PlayStation 5 remaster mean that this game is still on par with today's AAA releases. In short, Insomniac Spider-Man is both a great game and a great Spider-Man story, and five years later it's become a classic which spawned a great spin-off and is about to get a full-on sequel. And good luck to it because it's got big shoes to fill. But that's gonna have to be a topic for another video. In the meantime, please let me know your thoughts on Insomniac Spider-Man. Do you think this is the best Spider-Man game ever made? And if not, why and where would you rank it? As always, thanks for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.